fewer problems than last week. That's my hope anyway. <laughs> we will see how it works out. So good to be back. Thank you for uh, joining me again this week. Today, what we want to do is talk a little bit about uh, slow learning and fast learning. And this came up for me because of a few comments that I heard about um, people's disappointment with learning speed and how much they'd learned, how little progress they thought they'd made in a language. And actually, I, I thought it was really important to sort of dispel some myths about this and to talk very honestly and openly about what it means to learn a language and how long it actually takes. And, um, and I know that some criticism I'd even give myself for this negative criticism I would give myself is that sometimes I've done language projects that seem seemingly I learn a language very quickly and I talk about language projects from the past like German for example where people say well, how did you learn German so quickly and they're all very valid questions um, and so I thought it was probably a good time to just share with you those journeys of mine and uh, just make some comparisons for you as well in a very obvious way. So first of all, hello to everyone. Hello, hi Tiff, good to see you in Berlin. Um, nice, nice thumbnail, thank you for the thumbnail. Um, comment, that's very nice. I, I, I never know how, how you perceive my, um, my artwork on the thumbnails. I'm not um, obviously professional doing that, but um, I do my best. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see how I, I get on. Hopefully I will learn more and improve with time too. But thank you. Um, hello from Regensburg. Hello, Olga. Nice to see you too. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. So what I'm going to do is just talk to you a little bit about um, my story with German, my story uh, with um, Estonian and other languages, and just try to give you some comparisons with those languages and some other languages. So many years ago, I finished my degree course uh, at university in the United Kingdom, and I was offered the opportunity to go and live and study, live in Germany and study German. Now that was to study on my own. It was to live with a German speaking community in a German speaking community. Uh, it was a time where the internet was not a thing, uh, that cheap calls were not a thing. So basically, if you were in the country, you were in the country and that was it. And I had a very, very specific goal with learning German, and that was that I had to pass an exam in Madrid to be able to study German or take German as my second language. So if you imagine I went to study this course as a Spanish speaker and my my second language, um, well, my, my first foreign language for the course was German. And so I had to have a level of German that was reasonably high to be able to do business studies um, using German as well and doing translations from Spanish into German and from German back into Spanish and all those kinds of things that you usually do at university when you're learning a language, particularly um, orientated towards business language. Now, um, this is a long time ago. I had, as I say, I had three months to do this to sit the, before I had to sit the exam. So I finished my um, degree course. I skipped graduation. I didn't go to my graduation ceremony. And I moved straight to Germany because I saw this as a really good opportunity. And, you know, going and I'd been on in my year abroad and I noticed a huge improvement in my level, particularly of Spanish and Italian when I went on my year abroad. So I was keen to go and try and replicate that and get good at German. So I I did watch a couple of um, shows. I watched a few things in German before I went, like literally a couple of weeks before I went, just to have the very, very basics down. I always think it's a good idea to get the very basics before you go to a country and not wait until you get there to learn those things. Um, anyway, my plan was to learn German intensively. So I got all of the books uh, during my, um, my time in the UK. I bought the books that people used at school to teach German and moved to Germany. And then when I was in Germany, I also went to a language school and I bought all of the books that they used for all of the levels of German to teach the language intensively. And I sat for eight hours a day 
and went through those books and studied around about or went through around about 135 words roughly um, a day just to not worrying too much about remembering every single thing but at least covering a lot of ground and what I did was um, I I decided that it would be a really good use of my time because I was speaking only German, hearing only German, watching only German TV, listening to only German radio, speaking to Germans constantly who never spoke to me in English and only spoke to me in German. So I realized very quickly that I was getting a lot of repetition and I was seeing these words over and over again. So sometimes I would remember that I didn't remember a word, if that makes sense, uh, during that intensive period. So. I wouldn't obviously remember 135 words a day, that would be absolutely crazy, and then be able to use them. So what happened was over the three month period, these words would cycle through, cycle round, and I would I would eventually master quite a lot of them. And this took me to a level where I was able to communicate in German quite confidently in a relatively, actually very short space of time in terms of if you talk about months, like three months is, is nothing in language learning for learning a language and being able to speak. I went to Spain, I sat the exam and I passed the exam. Now I was fresh from Spain, from Germany at that point. But when I went to Spain, I arrived there, I passed the exam and uh, I, was, I, I was accepted to do German as my uh, foreign language um, at the Spanish University. What happened then is that I continued to study German and I was studying it at a slower pace um, together with uh, the you know projects and things I had to do in Spanish for my Spanish studies. I was studying um, marketing, accountancy, uh, business studies generally in Spanish and then I was doing German as my business language um, from a Spanish speaker point of view. Um, now that meant that I kept on speaking German, um, I kept on using it and I was also still in contact with the family back in Germany and I was using it, writing emails um, and, and things like that. Now um, Fast forward a little bit, and I, I got a job using German as well. Straight after I finished my studies, I was start, I was still going back to Germany. I went back and visited my the family there, and and used it. And I was constantly involved in speaking German in some way, because I, I started working through German. And slowly but surely, the years went by, and my German was solidified. And this is the key thing. Okay, so. I, yes, I learned German very quickly in terms of being able to start speaking the language very, very quickly, but I did it in a very intensive way and I did it in, with eight hours a day. Now, it, it's not common for me even to do studies of eight hours a day for any given language. In fact, I would struggle to do that nowadays because I have other commitments. I have friends and family and different things. This was at a very different stage of my life, but then it was followed through with continuous usage of German in my life, uh, both academically and then professionally. And so I had to continue using the language. So of course the German that I learned stuck and I built on it. Now, let me give you other examples where I've done projects uh, in languages. Again, intensively, I studied a language like Estonian for, uh, I did a month last year, and then I continued where I did four hours a day, which is not as much as eight hours a day. And I wasn't in Estonia, but I did four hours a day. And I, I got to, I got past the A2 um, level where I could, I could communicate quite a lot of things in, in Estonian. And I did the TV interview in Estonian as well. And um, actually what, what was more impressive to me wasn't the interview itself. It was setting up the interview through Estonian because it showed me uh, an ability uh, on the A2 scale of actually using language in a very concrete way to get a job done. And that for me was the biggest test is, and I set all that up through Estonian, which was fantastic. Now, unlike German, I haven't continued using Estonian um, in that type of intensive way since I did a month of Estonian, I extended my study period to kind of help to solidify 
uh, the language because I recognize that it possibly wouldn't happen, um, that it would stay and the level could go down as other languages I've studied intensively and then stopped have. It's a very natural process. So yes, the Estonian um, kind of stayed there to a degree, but I've definitely lost a, my edge and I've definitely lost a lot of fluency and I've definitely lost a lot of vocabulary. And um, my Estonian hasn't continued to grow since then. It's definitely plateaued and I'm, I'm doing my best to just keep it where it, where it was. I'm probably actually fallen down uh, with my Estonian to where it was back then. Um, and that, again, is something I accept and is natural. But I do want to just show you how Yes, that fast learning can work, but it needs to be followed up with it becoming an intrinsic part of your life. And if it doesn't, it's amazing how quickly that disappears. And in fact, a number of you have written these kinds of things um, in response to my question of, you notice easy come, easy go. If you learn it quickly, it goes quickly. If you learn it slowly, it stays. Let me just give you one example of a slow learning language for me. And that is Cornish. I have been studying it now for two years. I have reached possibly around an A2 level in Cornish after two years of study. I study the language for around maybe four hours a week or so. I have contact with Cornish and maybe a little bit in between two. So I take it at it's a fairly busy pace for a number of people, but it's a more manageable, normal, busy pace. It's not really, really slowly, but it's also not extremely intensive. And after two years of studying it, I've now sat my a, uh, my sort of A2-ish level exam, which is grade two for the Cornish Kesba um, exam board. And um, I, I can't imagine that I'm not going to pass that exam. Uh, so I do feel that I've got a mastery of the well, as far as I can have, of a lot of the content, the majority of the content to be able to pass that exam. Um, there are definitely holes in my knowledge too, and there are definitely parts of the Cornish language that I don't feel I fully uh, master. Um, some verb forms, for example, still um, leave me a little bewildered, and I, I feel a bit lost, but I think that's quite normal too. Um, but what I was really shocked by when I started learning Cornish and when I then did this month of Estonian. Now Cornish is related to Welsh. It's the sister, one of the sister languages of Welsh with Breton. Um, so in theory, I was learning a language that's related to a language I can already communicate in. Now, uh, Estonian is a language that's related to Finnish, which I had studied many, many years ago, but only to kind of an A2, A1, A2-ish level. And um, probably A2 level, I, I did the three first books of Swam and May study, but it's around about that level anyway. It's not into the B B levels. Um, and I did the course at um, Helsinki University. Um, but I forgot all of that because again, quick period of time, intensive study, left Finland, didn't use it again, and it just disappeared into the background. I still have some notions of Finnish, of course, it's not completely gone, but it didn't really help me that much with Estonian. Okay, there were some known things that I came across that I, I was like, okay, I remember that for my Finnish. But with a language that I actually spoke and could communicate in fairly well, um, I was expecting my Cornish to just fly. And it took me it's taken me two years to get to a point where I feel like I can maybe communicate quite a lot of what I want to say, but not everything. And certainly not at an even, um, you know, a, a high intermediate level. It's more of a sort of a basic intermediate kind of level, I guess, at the A2. Um, but what I was actually very shocked at and surprised at when I did this for both of those languages, and remember they were in parallel, is I'd done one year at that point of Cornish and I just completed and passed my um, grade one exam, uh, which is around about an A1-ish level. And then I did this, I completed the A2 course in Estonian within a month. And I also uh, did this TV interview, which there was, I knew there was no way I could have done that in Cornish. I would have really struggled to set up the interview. I would have really struggled to actually answer the questions and understand everything. It would have been a lot harder for me to do. I could do that at this point, for sure, but I couldn't back then uh, when I'd done one year of Cornish. Now, what's the difference? In terms of hours, 
probably the hours are fairly comparable. I mean, one year of doing three, four, five hours a week of a language and doing a month of four hours a day, there's a rough comparison in terms of hours, but what's the difference? The difference is this, when you study a language intensively, what you find is because it occupies most of your thoughts, those four hours or five hours or however many hours, even if it's like three hours a day or two hours a day, they're going to occupy more of your thoughts than doing half an hour or an hour a few times a week. And the reason is, is because your brain is focused so heavily on learning that language and using that language and contemplating that language that you're not only using those hours of study, but you're also con contemplating it and thinking about it and considering the language way after the study hours are finished. You may even be dreaming about the language or in the language as well. So even at rest, you're continually processing and regurgitating and repeating and coming into contact with the language in your brain. That is a big difference to doing a language less intensively at a slower pace where you do your hour, but like most things for an hour, you maybe think about it for a few 10, 15, 20, 30 minutes after the class, and then you kind of stop. And if you don't do anything the next day, or you only do 10, 15 minutes the next day, it's not the big chunk of your time during the day for you to then focus on it and concentrate on it, right? So that's where I decided that there was a big difference in this intensive process and this um, this you know, more relaxed approach to language learning. There is no better in terms of um, which is better. So I'm, I'm, I'm not one to say that I think doing it quickly is better or worse, or doing it slowly is better or worse. I, I think that both of them are just different. Um, the thing is that's really important is what you do after the learning process. Now, what's true is that when you do something over a slow, over a longer period of time, more slowly, you have more time to repeat a, a smaller number of words, a smaller amount of the language um, over a longer period of time. So it's more likely to stick in your long-term memory. Um, and if you study a language quickly, intensively, and you cover lots and lots of words, hundreds and thousands of words um, in a very short period of time, you have to cycle through that vocabulary very quickly. So you still need many, many hours following the intensive study to, to be able to even do that. It would be like having an Anki deck, if you, you use Anki, for example, and having 30 words to learn a week and cycling through them in a week and learning 3,000 in a week or 300 in a week you can see that the, the time to go through the, pro, the, you know, the whole process of just reviewing the words is just vastly increased. And if you don't do that, well, what happens? Well, the attrition, the languages, the language starts to float out of your head and you don't remember it. And I think that's the thing that we need to keep really at the forefront of our minds when we're considering fast or slow language learning. And we need to also measure that, okay, what have I put in and what am I getting out? So after now two years of studying um, Cornish and then a year and a bit of studying Estonian, well, a year after studying Estonian intensively, my Cornish is definitely way more solid in my brain than my Estonian, even though my, my Estonian went right up and surpassed my Cornish. Um, after the month of intensive study. So if you find that you're making these comparisons with anyone as well, remember that the comparisons need to be measured, that we, we take a, a picture of a, a space in time, right, where somebody's doing something or we perceive someone as doing something online, offline, and actually the reality can be quite different so the person that came to me and, and said that, you know, I, I, I don't think my, um, my level is as good as it should be. And to that person, I said, and I say, you're doing perfectly fine. Um, where, where do you expect to be? Because um, if you're putting in a certain amount of time and you're getting that out, you're getting out a good amount. Well, is it the perception of what other people are doing that maybe needs to be readjusted? Is it that um, 
we don't know what everyone does in their free time, right? We just don't know how much contact people have. And so these comparisons can be sometimes unhelpful. And I think the fact that you're doing something positive by learning a language is already great. And I would encourage you just to continue on your own path. And worrying about what other people are doing or how quickly we're learning actually can hamper the whole process because it can really impact our motivation to study. It can make us feel um, that it's not worthwhile. It can make us feel that we're you know, not really achieving much. But in fact, we are usually achieving a lot more than we imagine. It just comes down to um, our viewpoint and managing um, how we perceive things. Um, now, there are, of course, languages that we find easier to go through this whole process of learning a language quickly. And I've spoken about those before, and I'm happy to speak about them again. So one of the comments was, it depends a lot on the language we're learning. So there'll be languages that are related to languages you speak, and they are naturally going to be easier for you to access and understand more quickly than languages that are completely unrelated. So if I were to try and learn I don't know, Zulu right now. Um, it's fairly unrelated to languages I speak. There may be some things that I notice from other languages that I've studied or looked at that might help me along the way to give me a bit of a leg up, a bit of a push up, you know, to, 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 to access and understand what's going on more quickly. But um, it's going to be way harder for me to start communicating and using that language than it would be for me to start communicating to you somebody in another language that's similar to the languages I speak. Say, for example, Yiddish, a language I haven't really studied, uh, but I can hear it. I understand a lot of stuff that uh, people say in Yiddish. I've had people speak to me in Yiddish and I reply in German and I understand quite a lot and they understand quite a lot of what I say. So it's a very different thing in a very different beast. So comparing and contrasting even languages, time scales, time frames, um, exposure to languages is often unhelpful. And, um, and also, we just need to be very honest about what we actually do. Um, so I hope it helps you for, to know that it's taken me two years to get to what is roughly an A2 level in Cornish, a language that's related to a language I speak. And to feel solid and confident in what I know. Um, I hope that helps. I absolutely love the, um, the questions and the comments that I got before this, uh, before I started, and I will go back to all of the, I see lots of lovely questions and comments coming in as well, and I'll definitely have a look through those in a minute. I did get one comment on Twitter, and um, it was kind of a, a comment where it was asking, how do you, expediate, make it faster, that you learn a language. Um, potentially you can, and the way you can is to do intensive study. But, and this is the very big sort of cautionary warning before you do that, is this something you can keep up in the long term? Is it a language that you're natu naturally going to come into contact with? Will you have the opportunities I had to then go and study Sp in Spain, studying German, and then getting a job using German all the time? Is that a realistic option? Is that something that you would like to do? If that's the case, then it could be for a particular language, you might be able to do that. And there are definitely people who, who do that. I know people who have looked for for work in other countries and learn languages for that reason. And there is a, a real need, a burning need to do it, like I had to, to go on to this course at university in Spain. I didn't have any qualifications and I had to pass the exam to get in. And so there was a real need for me to do that. Otherwise I would have had to take English or French as a foreign language, which would have been absolutely absurd in Spain. Um, so I wanted to do German. I mean, I could have um, maybe done something like that, but it would have been slightly strange um, having studied, uh, you know, c coming from the United Kingdom, speaking French from a young age and um, having a degree in the language and having lived in France. It would be quite, a, it would have been quite an odd thing to do. But there we go. That's where I ended up. And I hope, I really hope that that helps to sort of, to couch things a little bit for you as well.
Okay, so now I've got to the end of what I wanted to say, and I just want to go back through your comments and questions. Um, for those of you who are not aware, the comments and questions are live, um, but I go back to the start just to check. So if I don't see your message straight away and you're posting right now, it's because I'm going back to the start to check. I will start this process on YouTube because YouTube didn't work last week and I want to be as fair as I possibly can to everyone. Okay, I'll do my best to answer every question I can. Okay, here we go. Um, hello, by the way, to everyone. Salamat malam, Dari German. Oh, salamat malam, Johannes. <laughs> um, wow, that sucks that you missed your graduation. I, do you know I have zero regrets about missing my graduation? Zero regrets. Um, for me, it wasn't about, it never is about what I get from, um, like, certificates or i mean they're nice they're nice to have um but i don't i don't necessarily need that i i actually learn my languages for my own personal internal desire and um, my own personal gratification if people give me compliments and if i get a certificate or pass an exam um sometimes i sit the exams because i i find them useful benchmarks to look back on to see what i've achieved and that's why i do it for cornish right now and that's why i did it for turkish um but i don't do it for a ceremony for people to honor me in that way necessarily not that i don't see the value in those i do and i think it's perfectly fine for other people to do it but for me it was i i had the choice of do i go to graduation or do i learn german for me definitely the bigger um, carrot was learning German and not traveling back to the UK and disrupting my study. Um, so I have zero regrets even to this day and I never have. I've never regretted that decision. I thought it was the best decision I made. Um, but I do appreciate you, um, you know, caring and saying that, you know, it, it could have, it could have been a bit sucky, I guess, depending my personality types, possibly just not that but um i would totally get it if people felt disappointed about missing their ceremonies i know how much work people put into their degrees and i know that it's nice to be recognized for that um i just had a better option <laughs> um and i didn't feel at that stage i felt probably more strongly that i didn't need the recognition for what i'd done i just enjoyed doing it for doing its sake and my my recognition was speaking the languages that i studied at university um so yeah did you learn those 135 words in context or out of context? Um, so they were in word lists. I, I, I took the, the words that I studied were from the school system in the UK and I just went through all of them. So they had kind of context to them while I was studying them, they were ordered. Um, so I learned, for example, fruits, veg, um, food, rooms in the house, things in the house, parts of the body, all those kinds of regular things that you'd learn. And I just made the conversations in the evenings fit around what I'd been studying so that I could get in as many of the words as possible. And that's what I did. And I even, I was testing myself constantly on the words. And because Germans and English are very closely related in many ways, um, I found that a lot of the words were similar anyway. So, I mean, especially parts of the body, it's pretty much the same. Um, yeah. What's your favorite in general? reading books or listening to whatever materials. Um, I, I mean, I like listening because I can do it with other things, whereas I find reading um, I have to make more time for and time's often at a premium for me. Um, but I do listen, to, strangely, I do listen to audiobooks from time to time. Um, and yeah I, the things i read tend to be more like news related um things that are happening around the world and uh, so a little bit less sort of reading like literature for example um so if i am reading something it tends to be something um fic not non-fiction I'm going pretty slow. I create 30 new flashcards of Spanish nouns from a frequency dictionary of Spanish, second edition, and memorize them each day. Shooting for 5K. Wow, Brian. Okay. The, the I mean, it's, it's great that you're doing it. I'm just going to give you a little bit of um, a cautionary tale about um, these frequency dictionaries, and that is that they order it in frequency of the words appearing. So sometimes they're not necessarily 
in line with what's important to you in your life. So if you're able to, in addition to, I mean, feel free to carry on doing what you're doing. Of course, it's entirely up to you what you do. I'm not going to tell you to do something different. Um, but I would encourage you quite strongly to make sure you include words that are relevant to your life and let them jump the queue of uh, the dictionary queue, for example, so that you get those in your head and you're able to start using them uh, more quickly. Um, they, they do definitely frequency ideas and uh, do have their place. Um, I just think that sometimes we need to um, be a little bit more practical with words that are more important to us. So to give you an example, if you work as an architect, architect will be way down the list of words that you would learn in a frequency dictionary, but it might be really important to you. And if that word is completely different, like for example, in Turkish, mimar, mimar is the word for architect in Turkish. And that is a word I learned at A1 level, um, not because I'm an architect, but because one of the people in my group was an architect and needed the word. And I then obviously talked about my friend who is a mimar, is, a, is an architect. And, um, and so it became really important to me. Uh, so that's one example, but there are many, many examples. It could be a fruit or a vegetable or something you're allergic to that is extremely important if you go to the country you need to be able to say that word it could be something you particularly like that's really important to you it could be a particular um fam family relationship that is not a common one in the dictionary that you might want to um, highlight over other words but there are many many reasons why i give this advice yeah uh, Johannes, could you elaborate a bit on your concept of anchor languages? Oh, wow. That's a, I could. I'm just wondering if that's a different topic for another day, Johannes. Um, I'm very happy to do that. Maybe I do a, another, maybe I can do another live about anchor languages. But um, in a nutshell, anchor languages are basically languages within a language family that you have um, very strong connections and awareness of strong to and awareness of um, so for example in the germanic languages um in in I, I, german would be one of my anchor languages um and then other languages that i've studied like luxembourgish tend to kind of fade back into the background and i don't worry too much about that because i've looked at them and i'm familiar with them and i understand them when i hear them but um they're not active languages so the anchor language normally is the one that always stays it, it anchors your knowledge of that linguistic group in a very sort of real way so that's kind of the idea in a nutshell but yeah maybe that's another one for another time as well for more depth if you'd like to hear more about that i'm happy to talk more about that how many hours do i study a day nowadays um very difficult to put time on it just because i'm, I'm constantly using my languages and doing something with my languages um so I don't know is a very, very horrible sort of answer to that. But definitely, um, I would say it's that kind of study is going to be 10 to 15 hours a week, usually, um, as a as kind of a, a, a bare minimum of, of study and dedication to languages, different languages. And then other languages on top of that, maybe, and at different times, all the different projects. So I've just finished my final Cornish class for the summer. And so before that I was doing maybe four, four hours of Cornish a week and possibly an extra hour on my own, so maybe five. So just on that one language, there's that. Then with Irish, I do three hours a week roughly. And then for, um, for Estonian, I normally do a couple of hours a week uh, to, to kind of keep, keep things going. Um, and then there are other languages that sort of figure in that I, I sort of look at or enjoy or play with. So, and then I speak a number of the languages too. So do we count speaking and using the languages that you study as language development? Maybe, maybe not. It depends on your point of view, but it's definitely not stagnation and going back. Um, I was thinking about learning Hindi and the future. Did you learn it? What do you think about it? Which are the most difficult aspects? Um, so I haven't really seriously studied Hindi at all. Um, I've looked at it um, 
insofar as I've maybe done the first four chapters of the Teach Yourself course. Um, yeah, I mean, for me personally, yeah, I found, I, I always find the writing system a little bit challenging in the beginning. Maybe I should just, um, you know, sort of grin and bear it and get over it. I, I find it hard to visualize some of the words when, when I see it in the script. And, um, and then using it, the, the issue for me now with a language like, like Hindi is, when do I use it? Because it's not a language that's present in a very easy way in the Balkans. Um, it, it, in the UK, it would be more accessible, but not in the Balkans in the same way. Um, so I possibly would prioritize Romani and studying that more than starting Hindi. I Just because I like that, I, I just like Romani people. Um, uh, generally, whenever I meet them, they're always so so friendly and so kind to me. So um, I've got a, kind of a, a tendency to want to be able to say more to them than I currently do in Romani. Um, picking a Romani language is the tough thing, though, because there are there are different ones, and particularly in um, you know in the Balkans, you get a number of very different Romani languages. Um, but yeah. Um, I'd say go for it and just, if, if you're into it and you want to try it, just try it and see how it, f how it fits and how it feels. Um, yeah. Did you ever study Kurdish language? No, I haven't. Um, so I, there are a couple of people who meet with me every week for language therapy sessions and they are studying Kurdish and, um, different types of Kurdish too. Um, but no, I haven't myself. I I am familiar with some words from Kurdish, but um, I don't speak any of the, the Kurdish languages. Um, I'd love to learn at some point, absolutely. Um, would you say that you lose only speaking ability or understanding ability, as well as after such intensive projects like the example Estonian? I'd imagine you'd still understand the language well. Interestingly enough, um, some of the if you do it very intensively, sometimes the understanding can also drift. Um, just because you're doing so many words in such a short space of time and you understand them. Um, and, and so basically what happens is you you cling onto a very small thread of, of understanding and awareness when you learn so many words that you don't actually hear. So you need to hear them very quickly to, to get them into your mind properly and to let them stay and establish themselves. So sometimes, depending on the language, understanding can lessen for sure. Um, but yeah, generally it is production that goes first. Absolutely. Bonjour Richard, comment vas-tu? Ah, très bien, merci. Ça va? Um, Es-tu en direct de la Macédoine? Non, je suis en Islande en ce moment. Uh, oui. Do you read books related to fictional novels in those languages you're studying? Not necessarily, no. I mean, I, I, I pick some up sometimes and I, I leaf through them or read some, but not, not, not as a rule, no. Um, I tend to prefer um, realia and uh, non-fiction. That's my preference if I'm going to read. Uh, but yeah, if um, sometimes I do. It doesn't mean I don't. ¿Cómo sabes si estás progresando lentamente o si te man man ah, mantienes en el mismo nivel? Así que no sabes. <laughs> es que no, no puedes saber esto. Es que depende de, de las conversaciones que tienes. Lo que pasa en mi vida, por ejemplo, si, si estoy hablando con alguien en un idioma, estaba hablando ayer, estaba hablando en español, y sí que me salen las palabras, pero sí que estaba hablando sobre lo que me interesa, por ejemplo, cosas para mí que son súper importantes, pero a lo mejor otro tema, por ejemplo, hablar de contabilidad, por, por ejemplo, ahora sí, sí, sí que sería un poco más difícil, eh, porque yo llevo muchos años sin hablar, sobre cosas así, es un asunto bastante, bastante importante y profundo y con vo un vocabulario bastante específico, digamos. Um, pero sería igual en inglés también, ¿eh? porque si no tiene esta costumbre de hablar un idioma así como, como durante el día, durante to todos los días o bastante a menudo, al menos, es que suele más suele ser una cosa, un proceso más difícil para, para seguir hablando uh, a este nivel. Pero sí que no, no se sabe. Um, I appreciate your existence. Oh, thank you, Ho. That's so sweet of you. Thank you for your time. You're very, very sweet. Thank you. I really appreciate you saying that. Thank you very much. 
Reading fictional novels, aka fantasies, is one of the best and greatest ways to reach, reach fluency and proficiency in a language according to my perspective. I prefer reading novels more than this thing. Yeah, you know, it's um polyglotism nation, it's it's a fair point. I mean, you know, I've got plenty of friends who uh, love doing that as well, and they do, they do very very well. Professor Aguales is one really fine example. So, so yeah, I am um, I absolutely agree with you. There's um, definitely different ways of doing these things, and and I I see I see actually a lot of there are things that definitely are beneficial to reading fiction over what I do for sure. Um, it just depends on your your life and where it where it leads and the kinds of conversations you have, I guess, and your preferences. Um, Thank you extremely for much for your humbleness, genuineness, perseverance, and available time. Thank you so much. Wow, that's super kind of you. Thank you. Um, if you did not speak English as your mother tongue, how would you study English pronunciation properly? I think it's one of the most difficult aspects. Francesco, <laughs> wow. Yeah, um, if I didn't speak English as a mother tongue, oh, my word. Um, English is, yeah, English is a pain for pronunciation, for sure. Um, probably, I, I, I wouldn't worry too much about my accent. I would be more um, mindful of that my pronunciation was something that people could understand easily. So I guess kind of things that I do normally, um, and that would be listening, maybe recording my voice, listening back, seeing if I can hear differences. Um, if I can, I can't reproduce them, asking where the sounds are made, maybe making use of the IPA, the International Phonetic Alphabet, uh, mouth positions are really important. Uh, getting feedback from speakers of the language, also important. Um, and then checking to see whether or not what I say is whether or not what I say is understandable. I guess they would be the things I do. Um, I do that mostly for other languages too, particularly when I find it quite difficult to to get the pronunciation right. Even if I reached a good level in a language quickly, I hope to. I hope keen learning. Uh, I hope to keep learning it for the rest of my life. It just depends on how how soon you want to start using the language, I guess. Absolutely, Ewan, absolutely. So if you can use the language quite quickly, then it's amazing how, how much it stays. You know when people talk about the idea of how long something takes, if you enjoy something and it takes, it feels like it takes very little time, but actually it's the same amount of time as for something that was boring and annoying to do, and it feels like it took forever. And if you take that over years, for example, let's say you start a degree course in whatever, and the degree course lasts three years. If you love what you're doing and you're passionate about it and you do it every day and you, you wake up and cannot wait to open your books and to learn and to talk about what you're doing and write the essays and all these kinds of things to explore that knowledge, three years goes by very quickly. If you wake up every day and you hate what you're doing and you have to do it and it's boring and it's awful, you cannot wait to not do it anymore because you're not thinking about it naturally. You're not waking up with that desire to study and to learn and to really ex you know, sort of expand your knowledge. You're just doing it because you have to sit and examine, and pass it and get through it and that's it. And that's what it is to learn a language quickly and to incorporate it into your life. Is It's that first example of it's just something you do and you love it and it's just part of you. And that's when the years melt away and you just get into the language. Yo soy profesor y sobre todo a uh, quererlo más rápido, pero ahora eh, que yo me defiendo en muchos idiomas, tampoco hay tanta prisa. Es verdad, yo no estoy de acuerdo contigo. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias por tu experiencia, porque sí que es importante. Eso sí que estoy de acuerdo completamente contigo. A ver, when when do you know you have learned enough of the language before you stop learning it johannes there's no there is no enough of the language the language always continues i mean even languages that i've like even english <laughs> there are words that I, I come across and learn still to this day and i don't think it's an, a particular issue that that happens but i'm not studying the english actively but i'm still open to learning I think that you still learn, but you may not be studying it actively. I think that might be the de the important definition there, there to make. Um, so I'm very happy to be corrected. I'm very happy to to get things wrong and then to learn new things and then 
hopefully eventually to get things right. But I'm also conscious that this is a an ever-changing landscape. And what I can do now is not maybe what I can do in four years' time or three years' time or even a year's time. And it may not be the same as what I, I'm able to do in 10 years' time or 10 years ago. And so I'm I'm very happy that there's a changing landscape there. There are new challenges and new things to learn constantly, even in languages that I'm not currently studying. So a language, for example, like that that I, I studied, because I wanted to feel like I'd got under the skin a little bit of the language was Finnish. And I wanted to understand how it worked and imagine having basic conversations in Finnish, which I, I kind of did in Helsinki. Um, now, I don't study Finnish now, but I do still follow uh, Finnish language creators online. And I come across their videos and I listen quite attentively and enjoy hearing Finnish again. And it it reignites that, oh, I remember that. The memories come back, you know. Um, uh, so, so it never stops. It never stops. Okay, let me see. You're an inspiration and motivation to all the public. Oh, thank you so much, Public Nation. You're so kind. Thank you. Um, I, mean, I remember Richard saying that if there are a few resources in language, religious texts are often available in languages. I guess I, it also helps if one has read the text in a previous language. Absolutely, um, Timothy. So yeah, religious texts. Um, many religious institutions have have. Um, have created texts that they use in multiple languages, um, and as language learners, we can we can make use of those um, translations and, uh, and 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 get a good comparison to, uh, between different languages. So yeah, why not? Why not use those kinds of text materials? Um, if, if there are not many things around, I've given that advice to other people. You don't necessarily have to um, believe what you're reading i mean you know you can really read a religious text for its intrinsic linguistic value and and they do have that um regardless of our beliefs i mean i'm not here to convert anyone to any religion or anything or any belief system my main goal is to is to help give um, encouragement and advice tips and um even you know some ideas of where to find materials in different languages and for a number of languages particularly um i gave this advice to somebody for um for tunisian arabic <laughs> check out some religious texts from say uh, you know the watchtower um site has um has it if you're in a country where uh, watchtower uh, uh, is 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 not allowed so for example in russia for example uh, that would be an issue then obviously take your country's um um you know what's allowed and what's not allowed uh, as well into consideration before i just i'm not sending you there randomly i would also preface it with a caveat of you know be aware of your location and what's acceptable and what you're allowed to do and um and and you know move forward in, in, on that basis but they, they they have a number of really really good stuff uh, really good things in um in a number of languages including Tunisian arabic so <laughs> if you're interested in that kind of thing then i would say yeah go for it um let me see um so for example is easier for polish slavic person to learn russian yes absolutely i saw a czech slovak native speaker that learned russian in three months yep JR, absolutely. It's way easier. So when I was in Czech Republic, I first went there in 2001, and I was there for three months, uh, roughly, and I was doing my best to learn Czech. I was going, it was going very, very slowly because it was my first Slavic language, and um, this guy called Kuba, who was from Poland, moved there, and within a month, he was talking to people in Czech. <laughs> I was like, wow, that's amazing. But yeah, absolutely. He was a super nice guy as well. Um, so I was happy for him, but I was also like, wow, it's cool. I wish I could do that. And of course, it took me a little bit longer. Um, was ist dir beim Deutsch lernen am schwersten gefallen? Ah, wie, was, ah, was die Grammatik betrifft? Ja, keine Ahnung. Ja, vielleicht. Ja, was soll ich sagen? Ich meine, ja. Keine Ahnung mehr. Ich, ich meine, es ist ja so lange her. Es, es war für mich eigentlich ziemlich natürlich, weil ich ja Schwedisch so, schon ziemlich gut konnte. Und ja, das hat mir auch dabei geholfen, 
Ähm, ja, ich, ich, keine Ahnung, jetzt, ich meine, ja, vielleicht die Fälle, aber das ist ja schon, ich meine, das, das dauert, ne? bis man die, die lernt und ich habe das eigentlich ganz natürlich auch gelernt und ja, ohne die Tabellen so zu lesen oder so, ich habe einfach so mit den Leuten geredet und ja, so einfach quatschen, ne? <lacht> okay. Um, hi, hi, hello. All the email exchanges are great for monitoring progress as well. Yeah, absolutely. Or even, Timothy, old, uh, for you, old Twitter um, uh, messages probably as well. I guess you've got those too. It's really, really good. Yeah, remembering the emotions is always cool with those messages. Richard, I was wondering in which languages you've read books. I find reading books in foreign languages so much harder than speaking. Really, Maurizio, that's interesting because... Um, I mean, we had to, so I, I mean, kind of two minds about this with the whole reading thing, um, because even in English, I mean, you know, when you read, there are going to come, there are going to be things that you, you come across that I knew or you don't use. And so you understand, but you don't use. Um, depends on the language, first of all, because some languages share a lot of vocabulary, others don't. Um, and some take from certain languages as well. Uh, but for example, at univer uh, sorry, at school, just at school, um, in French, we we read one of one of the books we read was Germinal by Emile Zola, which is like this huge, thick French book, and it has some very bizarre words in it um, for like random French, you know, that you speak on the street. Um, but we got through it, and we were we were all like what 16, 17, maybe. And so I don't know. I mean, that, and that's a, that's fairly serious French literature, you know, piece of a very serious piece of French literature. Um, so, yeah, I, I know what you mean, I think. Um, but the thing with reading that, for example, if you want to speak a lot, it depends what you want, right? If you want to read lots of literature and pick up a lot of very, a lot of passive vocabulary, yes, carry on doing that. Amazing. If you want to speak, a lot of the time, first of all, some of those words you're not going to be able to use in normal conversation because the people you're speaking to might not know them. And it'd be quite strange for them to hear words that they don't know. They'll just think you've got it wrong as a foreigner, first of all. Second thing is also it might make them feel a bit a bit bad about not knowing those words. Um, thirdly, that you may stumble across things a lot, like stumble over things more because you're you're thinking about very precise thoughts, whereas in quite regular conversation, you would just be sort of just go blah, and it would sort of all come out. Um, so but both things are good. There's not a bad, but they are different. And so I think it's important to keep in mind that there's a difference there that's important to, to remember when, when it comes to language learning. So it depends which road you want to go down, because there definitely are, there is a fork in the road to a degree with this and um and you also have to think the practicalities of what you're reading and what you want to learn from your books in a world where you're communicating with ordinary everyday people who may not use that language um versus wanting to speak very freely fluently naturally as people speak the language and use it today could be quite different does that make sense I hope I'm making sense. I hope I make sense. This is just I'm sort of my my, my thoughts as I read these questions. Um, I've been recently more into contact with French. I started speaking with French speakers, but what I'm struggling with is a spoken language is different from it. Yeah. Okay. So you've you just ex exactly said exactly what I meant to say here as well, in a nicer way than what's inside books. Yes, yeah, spoken language and what's inside books can be completely different. So what would be your advice to get used to the spoken language? Um, speaking, for sure. And also maybe listening to, you could get used to some podcasts, some um, some TV shows. Sometimes TV shows can feel a bit staged, but um, definitely things that people are watching and hearing. Chat shows are often are very good. If you can watch chat shows, I found that in German was particularly useful. So I used to watch Babel, if any German speakers know Babel. Um, she was um, a chat show host in Germany when I was living there. And I used to listen to regular German people complaining in German <laughs> or shouting at each other in German. So that kind of thing was, was quite handy. And it was very natural and very normal and very ordinary German. Um, okay. 
for when I'm learning a language, listening to news can sometimes be toxic because the news is really negative. And I feel reading books is better and less toxic, negative. Yeah, JR, definitely. I get, I get what you mean. Maybe instead of watching the news, you could watch like documentaries or something on things you're interested in as well. Uh, instead of that for listening, that might be another way of around it. Languages like German have amazing documentaries. So um, there could be things like that that you could be interested in. Um, also, audiobooks uh, can be quite useful. Kabarko Baik, Richard Samogok, Kamusuka, Islandia, Senangkalao, Bisa Belajar, Lebi, Tentang Bahasa, Jankar. Ah, uh, Anker. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I mean, my my Icelandic, for example, is is is. I mean, it, uh, I, I I can get by in Icelandic. It's not that I speak it amazingly well, but I can get by, and uh, hopefully I will improve while I'm here. Yeah. Who knows? But yeah, uh, but I um I hope to get improve my Indonesian as well. <laughs> um. Also, when I'm reading a book, I feel like it's slow because some books are really long and it takes time to finish compared to the news, which is fast. Yes, that's definitely. Um, I'm using Duolingo uh, baseline. I'm going to Korean school. What do you think of those? <clears throat> okay, so Duolingo... Mm, um i've made a i made an entire thing on duolingo um it might be best to rewatch that and see what i thought um and korean school sounds cool <laughs> that rhymes there we go korean school sounds cool um yeah i mean look people get different things out of duolingo so i'm not going to sort of beat up on it um in any way for swahili i didn't find it to be the most useful thing but um I've heard other people say very nice things. And in fact, I met with a friend here in Iceland and uh, she she was raving about using it for French and um, said that she felt she made great progress. So um, look, different things work for different people. This is the thing, right? It's pretending to use it what I do. And if you follow me and what I do exactly, that it's going to work for you 100% of the time. It's not. It's just not um, necessarily. Some of it might. But what I do when I work with people is I listen to what they say and I give them advice that is not always advice that I follow myself because I recognize that every individual is different and that every individual responds to different things. And this is really, really important uh, that we're all different. And this is kind of my philosophy of a holistic approach to language learning and your lives are different to mine. Um, so why would what I do work for you necessarily? Your your history, all of your all of the ho mental hooks in your brain to remember and recall language are different to mine. So what I do doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to work for everyone. But this is why I prefer to a very open approach to, to language learning that I remain open to other things, right? You know, sometimes what what Lydia Machova does works well or works better than what I do. Um, personally, for me, for another person, sometimes what you'd admire does will work better for other people than it does uh, from what I do. Uh, sometimes what Luca Lampariello does, exactly the same. All of these people that create content and, and study languages and study them effectively and efficiently, they all work in a different way to me. And that's fine. Professor Aguales, again, another person. We have very different outlooks and approaches to language learning in many ways. Sometimes, obviously, our paths do cross, and we do agree on a number of things, of course, and we do similar things. But we also have significant differences in, in some of our approaches, and that's fine. It doesn't make what I do less valid or what he does less valid or what she does less valid or what they do less valid. It is just different. And so difference is good. It's not a bad thing, being different. Um, and yeah, I, 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 I see the world as individuals. <laughs> We're all very, very different from each other. Um, I know we like to associate with groups and I know like we like to group people together into different things, but actually we're all individuals that have very different ways of thinking because we've had very individual and different experiences on this planet and different education, different family, different friends, different countries of origin, different uh, experiences in life. Um, different challenges and different likes and different dislikes. Everything's different for every individual. So I'm much more of an individual person than a than a group person. 
these people do this or this type of person does that. Um, it may not be the most popular thing to say, but it's um, it's what I see as true from my experience of the world. Yeah. So Spencer from Seattle, merci de faire cette vidéo. Would you consider turning these chats into a podcast? Me gusta escuchar sus videos mientras que camino, pero no me gusta pagar para YouTube Premium. Uh, maybe, yeah. I mean, you're, you're not paying for YouTube Premium right now, right? You're just paying. You're, this is free online that I'm doing this. So I, I'm not charging anyone anything. Um, but yeah, I mean, why not? I could potentially make a podcast if, if there's a desire. If anyone's out there and wants to sort of help me as well, feel free to reach out um, if you've got advice. Um, I wonder if he came to you. Eugene School, we had a gentleman from Poland named Kuba in our Spanish conversation group. Who knows, Tiffany? Never know. Could have been. Um, this guy moved to Prague. Yeah, and he, I don't know what happened to him after that, really. He worked in, he, he worked, this is how long ago it was. He worked in the internet cafe that I had to go to to write my emails. That's how long ago this was. Um, yeah, but um, Prague at the time was kind of like, the Amsterdam of um, Central and Eastern Europe. A lot of people came um, for a number of reasons. If they, they wanted to live a life that was outside of the societal norms for where they were, that maybe taboos or things like that, that they uh, they found they had a newfound freedom in Prague. So yeah, he, he came for out of those reasons, in fact. Um, which I'm doing Korean, Mandarin, let me see. Uh, da, 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 da. What do you think is the best place to learn Japanese? Oh, wow, that's a big question. Uh, to learn Japanese and Chinese. Very big questions. Unfortunately, I've got so many more questions and I can't get to them all. Um, how to learn, learn German? I, I talked about that at the beginning, so I'll definitely ask you to rewatch this at the beginning and also um, maybe uh, if you speak German, there's a, I did a, a video in German on YouTube. Um, I, well, I made a video on, on learning German on YouTube in German. But um, what happened was when it was made, uh, I, I put the subtitles in, in YouTube, and then YouTube changed everything and deleted all of those old videos, uh, captions. So now they, they no longer exist. And I, I just don't have time to to go back and rewrite the whole thing again because I've just got my workload is, is so much crazier. But if you do understand German, you could watch it if you're able to watch the video. Est-ce que tu apprends l'islandais en ce moment en Islande? En fait, j'ai fait un cours d'islandais à l'université il y a neuf ans à peu près. Et puis, euh, euh, non, je n'étudie pas en ce moment. Euh, J'utilise avec mes potes euh, en ville. Je parle avec les gens. Et euh, ouais, je vais peut-être continuer à apprendre un, encore un peu. Et on va voir. Ce n'est pas pour moi. Pour moi, c'est en fait... Euh... Oui, je n'étais pas... Je n'étais pas... Euh, le pourquoi pour moi, venir ici. Ce n'était pas... Euh... Ouais, ce n'était pas en fait ce que je voulais faire ici en Islande. Mais j'aimerais bien apprendre encore mieux. Parce que c'est une langue que je n'utilise jamais dans ma vie. Um, à se copier, c'est impossible d'utiliser uh, l'islandais. Et même pour le travail, je dis très, très peu, très, très peu pour mon travail. Um, hello, news, definitely use more simple vocabulary than literature. Absolutely, yeah. News is aimed at the general public, which is, uh, makes, I guess it's a natural way of prioritizing the language that you learn. And then if you want to get deeper into the language, then literature as well, absolutely. Um, that's so true, Richard. It works for some people when it may not work for others. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for this. I like I like that you're wow. You will be assimilated. Resistance is oh you have do, oh you have cook have cookies. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh my word, I love how random that was. If you if you did podcasts, I would listen to advice for hours. Wow, Svetlana, that's really sweet of you. Thank you. Maybe I should do a podcast, I don't know. Um, what tool do you use for practicing language, not learning? Um, so I tend to, I tend to actually use learn languages nowadays or stick to languages that I, I watch 
sorry, I watch, I see and come into contact with on a regular, normal day-to-day -day basis because they're the languages that I find easiest to maintain. So they would be languages I use in and around where I live, the languages I come across for work, um, and they're the, the main ones. And then um, online, for example, yeah, I follow certain creators on uh, YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, and um, Facebook, not so much, but I do use Facebook. And, and those are the, the the places where I come across it on sort of on my phone when I'm just swiping through. And I hear lots of languages by doing that. I, I, I really enjoy the kind of the mix up I get. Um, and then sometimes I'll watch things or read things in different languages too. So yeah, there's quite a lot of different things. I'm going to go to the very bottom of the, the comments on on Instagram to see if I can catch up a little bit. I'm sorry, Instagram, but this is really, really difficult for me to... Okay, Julio, I'm gonna move to Instagram. I'm so sorry, thank you for your comment about my beard. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm glad you enjoy my my, my facial hair. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, it keeps me warm. <laughs> okay. Entre el chino mandarín, entre el chino y el alemán, ¿Cuál es más importante? Uh, ¿Qué ventajas hay de uno a otro en, ah, en lo laboral? Uh, miro, miro y agradezco compartir sus conocimientos. Muchas gracias. Pues para mí el alemán es mucho más, mucho más útil porque nunca he tenido la oportunidad para trabajar en, con mi chino. Um, aprendí chino mandarín en, en la Universidad de Dalana, en Suecia pero es un idioma que, que no utilizo para nada. En mi vida, por ejemplo, en mi vida cotidiana en, en Macedonia, pues no tengo con quién hablar el idioma. Um, no hay mucho chino y los que hay no hablan mandarín y hablan macedonio o búlgaro muy bien, así que puedo comunicar con ellos en estos idiomas, por ejemplo. Y a veces también hablan inglés, pero suelen hablar bien macedonio o búlgaro. Así que hablo, utilizo estos idiomas para comunicar con ellos. Fuera de esto, pues para viajar de vez en cuando sí que utilizo mi chino mandarín, pero no muy rara vez porque es un nivel bastante, no muy básico, pero bastante básico. Y, y para mi trabajo sí que tenías que tienes que tener un nivel bastante alto y estar ya dedicado a estudiar o a estar en el, viviendo en el idioma para utiliza, utilizarlo para tu trabajo. Y eso sí que me falta con el chino mandarín, por ejemplo, en mi vida. Así que para mí es muy fácil el, el alemán. Depende de tu vida, depende de tu, tu contexto laboral y personal. Y geográficamente, ¿dónde estás, por ejemplo, también? E influye bastante. Hi, Richard. Love from India. Oh, hello. I love India. I've never been and I want to go desperately. Uh, it's me, Anui. I'm learning German. Some tips. Are the tips for learning? Wow. Okay. So, I mean, okay, I did get a question about learning German and some tips. I mean, I, 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 think, I don't think you can go far wrong uh, if you look at the Deutsche Welle website, dv, dv, uh, dot de. They have like German for foreigners. So, you put in, into Google dw um, learn, learn German. Um, they should come up with the Learn German website and it takes you through loads of videos and loads of content and it's really cool. So that's a good place to start. And I'll have a look to see if I can figure out some other things to give you as a, an opportunity for studying. But that's what I would do um, if I were to start now again. Start looking at that. It's a really good website. It's like for Welsh, we've got this great website now, Disky Cymraeg, you get to learn Welsh, um, dot Cymru, and it's really, really cool for learning Welsh anyone who's interested in knowing Welsh. Um, uh, what's my religion? Um, so I don't talk about religion um, on, on my channel, um, only in the context of language. I don't go into those kinds of details just because I find it a divisive thing when I talk to a number of people from very different backgrounds and faiths, and I prefer to respect everyone. So um, I, I kind of, I, I don't see myself in one box of anything. I, I'm 
very much a, we're all individuals out here and um and so so yeah when it comes to putting myself in a box there are certain boxes you might want to put me in that's fine um it's your your way of organizing the world but i don't personally put myself into boxes in that way um all the time there are certain truths i was born in the united kingdom and i have a uk passport but yeah <laughs> It's as far as it goes from my sort of belonging to certain things, I guess. And um, yeah, being um, of Welsh heritage, I guess they're, they're truths, but yeah. But um, it, it, beyond that, um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly open <laughs> to most people and things. I, 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 I like to sort of enjoy everyone without people putting me in too many boxes that they feel they can no longer relate to me if, if that makes sense um, so yeah es necesario ser muy muy converso ¿eh? para hablar fluido cualquier idioma es que no no entiendo la pregunta es que porque creo que te ha hecho algo con lo de esto de, de corregido a lo mejor el idioma Autom automáticamente me pasa igual también ¿eh? es que pero no entiendo no, per perdón pero no entiendo la pregunta uh, si me hace falta necesario uh, para hablar un idioma no no entiendo la pregunta P perdón no entiendo ay perdón Ruti, gracias por comp compartir tu tiempo y experiencia con nosotros uh, lo aprecio mucho Ajá. este es esta semana comencé usando Speakly. ¿Qué idioma practicas con este, esta, esta? Pues yo con Speakly estaba estudiando um, la Estonia y sí que funcionó bastante bien para, mí, para mis estudios y sí que me gustó mucho. Um, pero no he utilizado otro idioma en Speakly. Um, hay otras personas que uh, utilizan en mi... Sí, en, en línea, por ejemplo, me dicen que, que utilizan para, para español, para italiano también, creo. Y sí, sí, creo que funciona bien para ellos también. Pero no sé, no puedo hacer la conversación porque son idiomas que ya hablo. Así que sería un poco, un poco raro ¿no? empezar a estudiar español de nuevo con Speakly cuando ya hablo. Um, o los otros idiomas incluso es igual, porque hablo casi todos los idiomas de Speakly. Um, solo esto de, de Estonia y, y de, de Finlandia no, no hablaba. Ok, Sait, ¿cuál tu guerra a Islandi? Ya para ver a Yerna, Nuna. Ya, tala solida islandsku, vid folk Yerna, o a la mera islandsku. Ya, so, es tu guerra a Islandi. A fi, es una fara, ya, a café, ya, tu, ya, que tu escribe, ya, email, ya, vete, que Yerna private message e Instagram ja det la uh, uh, att tala uh, i Reykjavik att du är här nu i Reykjavik um, jag vet inte okej okay. let me see so I think I've got through a lot of the questions I had oh how can I learn Hungarian oh wow um, <laughs> good question um, So, I mean, long answers, I guess, with this. Looking for books that work for you and that you enjoy um, uh, may be the best way. So there are some Hungarian books that you can get. You could look at the Teach Yourself and the uh, Asimil or the, um, or the colloquial books as well, of course. Um, and then finding somebody that speaks Hungarian, maybe on Italki or something, um, might be a cool thing to, to do. Um, Yes, yeah, so that they would be starting points. Um, have a look at what Lindy has put out as well about Hungarian because she studied it and she is studying it now still. I'm in Pamplona running with the bulls and I just met your Russian Ukrainian doppelganger. Okay, wow. <laughs> okay. Okay, wow. A doppelganger, hey? And thank you for your pieces of advice. I can't, can't wait to open Murphy's books and start learning. Fantastic. Go for it. Okay, I think I've got to the end of the questions. I hope I have. If I forgot your question or I've missed it, I don't mean anything by it. It's just that 
uh, time runs out very quickly and we've been on for an hour and qu a quarter and I could stay on for longer but unfortunately yeah I'm not I'm not at my normal home and so staying on for even longer is probably not fair um because other people are being very quiet so that I can talk <laughs> and I I'm, I'm, I I like to be respectful as best I can for the uh, understanding and uh care for me to be able to do these lives um I would love to speak to you again next week at the same time same place so please feel free to write your questions make sure to give me a like to give me um to subscribe if you haven't subscribed already um if you want to work with me personally the link to patreon is there you're very very welcome to do that i'm very open to giving advice and help and i can do that in a more individual way on patreon um and obviously i'll continue to do these free of charge um, as long as I possibly can and um, yeah but feel free to reach out and um, if you want to treat me to a coffee there's a coffee link as well in the description you can treat me to a coffee too <laughs> okay but otherwise you're welcome to come free of charge every week I make no pressure for any of you to uh, give anything that you can't afford I do this voluntarily because I just enjoy sharing my passion for languages and and my time with you Take care and I'll speak to you soon. Bye-bye. Happy language learning.